appreciate the songs that blend into our lesson today on the sin of materialism. We might even call it the challenge of materialism. A lot of people do not understand what a grievous blunder this emphasis in life really is. The Lord willing, tonight our lesson will be Eight Incentives for Heaven. Read chapters 4 and 6 of Hebrews, and you'll be ready for that which has already been outlined in the Bible. The best sermon outlines are already in the Bible. We just need to find them and let the Bible do the talking. When I come again in a couple of weeks, the Lord willing, in the Bible class and before we have our assembly worship, and I'm saying this so every one of you will come back and be with us on this, I'm going to discuss the 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew. Why did Jesus come when he came? Why was it the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4, 4, in due time, Romans 5.6, when Jesus came? Why didn't he come earlier or later? There is a precision honed reason, and we'll be discussing that bridge that spans the close of Malachi in the Old Testament with the opening of the New Testament and the coming of Christ. I believe it's the most essential overlooked lesson in Bible study, and a lot of people are missing this tie-in and thus miss some of the points of the New Testament. Did you know there's some New Testament verses you cannot understand if you don't study this period? If I can prove that, you'll see the importance of it, won't you? You won't say, I don't like history. In John 10, we read it was the Feast of Dedication. You'll never read of that feast in the 39 Old Testament books. And here's a verse that we're expected to understand when we read the New Testament. But we have to study that. There are several things that you do not understand in the New Testament, even specific verses, if you haven't learned this lesson. So I hope I've excited your interest and curiosity that you'll come and be with us two weeks from today when we return. The sin of materialism. Perhaps we could use the word hedonism, not heathenism, but H-E-D-O-N-I-S-M, the playboy philosophy, that which panders to the flesh. Carnality, Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The word carnival came from the background meaning of that word in Romans 8, 6. We could call this secularism, the opposite of spirituality. We could call it mundane matters, known as mammon in the New Testament. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 36 and 37. Our Lord said, Do not fear him who is able to destroy the body, but is not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. In James 5, 1 to 3, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl, for the miseries that will come upon you. The gold and silver that you hoarded by robbing your workers in the field, now is cankered. The garments you purchased are moth-eaten and useless. And you're like the cattle on a thousand hills, grazing contentedly today, and tomorrow your neck chopped off in slaughter. In James chapter 2, he warned the brethren of giving special treatment to the wealthy and mistreating the poor, saying, Sit here. Don't sit in the choice places. If we're not careful, we're going to see history repeating itself in our attitudes. 2 Timothy 3, 4 says they were lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's materialism. Put them in mind not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Paul told Timothy in working with the church in Ephesus, 1 Timothy 6, 17. In Luke 2, 49, Jesus expressly stated, I must be about my father's business. Not Joseph, who is not my father, but my heavenly father's business. And for 33 and a half years, one third of a century, he contentedly pursued the will of the heavenly father. That is the opposite of materialism. I've often said, if you studied the book of Luke and its 24 sterling, scintillating chapters properly, you could divide it right down the middle. This side, spirituality. This side, carnality. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. But most of the people he dealt with throughout the book of Luke were carnally minded in a secular way. When I first began preaching in those little blue song books that the Gospel Advocate put out uh, that Brother L.O. Sanderson was the editor of and still one of my favorite song books, but like so it had plenty of songs in it, there was a song we never sing anymore, Take the world but give me Jesus, all its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever through the ceaseless years the same. 
And thus the contrast between being about the Father's business and being overwhelmed in carnality. Over in the little town of Golden, a little village now outside uh, Mineola, our brother who wrote the songs, uh, Brother Tedley, many of the songs, and wrote the song we were just singing and the one we're going to sing for the exhortation, sat on the front steps of a little church building that's now crumbling into the dust. And at the sunset uh, evening hour wrote, Earth holds no treasures but perish with using however precious they be. In 1934, the Depression had overwhelmed his pocketbook, as so many others. He had day-old scrap bread and red beans and water gravy like I did, but we all made it through, all right. But earth holds no treasures. Why should I long for this world and its sorrows? Contrast between earthly problems and eternal verities. But if you want to read the greatest, the classic passage on materialism and its woefulness, read Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Most of us have become familiar with the last two verses in that book. But Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11, the wealthiest man per square inch who ever lived said, whatever mine eyes saw that I coveted, that I desired, that I wanted, I purchased. I made it my own. Now I look on all that my hands had labored to do. And I say, vanity and vexation of spirit are striving after the wind. There's no profit under the sun. And if anyone knew the woes of a wealthy man who put his trust in uncertain riches, Solomon did. And so the book closes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or bad. In Proverbs 11, Solomon wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, in verses 4 and 8, Riches profit not in the day of God's wrath. Toward the end of the Bible, in Revelation 18, 17, in one hour, so great riches has come to naught. One modern speech translation says, in one moment, whether it's one moment or one hour, all wealth will be consumed. You remember what Peter said to Simon the sorcerer who tried to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit with money? Your money will go to perdition with you. Now, one modern speech translation bluntly says, your money will go to hell with you. Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust of the corrupt, and where thieves do break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust that consume, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I heard of a fellow in Oklahoma many, many years ago, plowing in a widow's field. She must have been the ugliest woman in Oklahoma, and had eight kids. And he was plowing out there, and he turned up something with the plow that looked like gold. And he had a dilemma. He's going to have to hurry up and fall in love with her, propose to her, and marry her, and inherit all that gold. And he worked at it and finally accomplished it. And on the way home from the funeral, I mean the wedding, uh, she turned and started laughing. He knew something was wrong. She said, I took that to the assayer's office, and it was fool's gold. <laughs> he knew what fool meant. So many people emphasize the wrong things and thus wind up uh, with a bag full of holes. Haggai 1 verse 6. Their priorities and their emphasis in life will not get the job done. They've forgotten about stewardship. And I don't hear that word very often by my brethren. It's been in the Bible a long time. There's a denominational group that has a board of stewards. Well, they misunderstand what it means too instead of deacons or elders. But the word stewardship is a great New Testament concept. We've been left in charge of another's treasure. And our Heavenly Father has left the kingdom in our hands and the work of the Lord. He has no hands but our hands has no feet but our feet, has no tongues but our tongues. He has no words but our words as we mouth the words of Scripture. And so when we consider our stewardship of what God's entrusted with, that becomes a very challenging point. In 2 Corinthians 9, we read that when we give generously, God gives us more, not so we can get more or have more, but so we can use more to spread his word. We are reaping what we sow. It just never ends. Give and it should be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Or what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. <clears throat> Luke 6, 38. I think we fail to realize that God gave everything he had. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Christ gave himself. You know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though we were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. That's stewardship. And the Macedonians in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians 8, 5, first gave themselves. David said, I will not give unto the Lord that which cost me nothing. 
2 Samuel 24, 24. So this matter of stewardship means God has given to me that I might be a proper steward of his will so that I might get more so I can give more, so I can get more so I can give more. It's not so I can retain it and build up treasures on earth for self. Too many times we misunderstand, misconstrue the concept of stewardship. It really makes no difference how much money you have. It's what you do with it. It's not what we own that makes us rich because riches are very rare. But it's how honest we are as we lay our hand on our own and the master's share. So Abraham was a very wealthy man, but he's in God's Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11. Some of the best men I've ever known and some of the most gracious givers are the wealthiest, but they do not make money to get rich. They make money to give it to the cause of Christ. Years ago, I moved to a town and preached there five years. I've been back several times. Some of my best friends are there. That's been 30-something years ago. But I met two brothers who were quite wealthy and had really a business that was going. And I don't believe I ever met at least one of them, at least, that cared as little for riches. He would come to work with a hole in his shirt. And uh, if a mechanic that he was paying, say, $10 an hour couldn't get the job done, he'd get down underneath that thing, take his coat off, and have grease on his nose and his face when he got out, and that was the happiest time of his day. And that afternoon, he'd probably give $100,000 to the cause of Christ. The point is, he understood what stewardship meant. And he worked harder than a lot of people in his employ, perhaps more than anyone else. But in 2 Timothy 4.10, we read of one Demas, who had once been a fellow laborer with Paul in the gospel, and this sad refrain, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, 2 Timothy 3, 4. Dead while she liveth, 1 Timothy 5, 6, yes. Their priorities were wrong. If any love not the Lord, uh, if any love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. So Demas quit loving God and started loving the world, and he abandoned the service of Christ. I wrote an article once entitled Demas. That was the title. And it was republished in many different papers. And I asked, what happened to Demas? Did he quit studying his Bible? I've known some preachers like Demas who did and quit. Did he associate himself with the wrong kind of people? Evil companions corrupt good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Did he begin to read and follow philosophy instead of the sacred text? 1 Timothy 6 speaks of uh, philosophy and uh, knowledge falsely so-called. What about the world did he love that caused him to depart from Christianity? Demas had a lot of kin folks through the years. Luke 17, 32 says of Lot's wife, remember Lot's wife. Well, what do we remember about her? Genesis 19, she turned back and looked to a city of filth, of materialism, of secularism, of hedonism, of mundane emphasis. And Lot's wife's not the only one that ever did that. I have known, I know, a hundred brethren, and about 30 preachers in my day that have apostatized because of love of money, of secularism, or human philosophy, and there is nothing more tragic in all the world than to see someone who was once faithful and fervent and fruitful in the cause of Christ depart because of a love for the world. Out of this life I'm unable to take things of silver and gold that I make. All that I cherish and all that I keep I must leave behind when I fall asleep. And I often wonder what I shall own in that other world where I go alone. What shall they hear and what shall they see in the soul that answers the call for me? Will the great judge command when my task is through, my spirit for gaining some riches to? Or at the last shall it be mine to find? All that I've worked for I've left behind. I never ever thought I'd have two quarters in my pocket one time. We were really, really poor. Some of the best money I made was as janitor of a two-room country schoolhouse. I made $2.81 every two weeks. Oh, I was wealthy. But that night I'd spend it all on jelly beans and popcorn and cowboy show and a little vase for my mother so she wouldn't spank me for misbehaving before I left. And, uh, the point I'm making is though I was absolutely wealthy. I had $4 and something about $5 a month. That's unheard of. Just yesterday when I went into a place to buy some gas, there was a kid there with two items, dollar and eighty one cents. Man, we went to the Red River County Fair with a quarter and thought we were doing good. Nickel here, nickel there, and pretty soon you had about all the entertainment you could stand. We live in a different kind of world, a world of materialistic enterprise. 
Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. Everybody listening? We're going to the book of Luke for three or four classic illustrations of materialism. And you're going to be surprised the first one because a lot of people wouldn't count that materialism, but it was. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Jesus is in Bethany at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, his dear friends. He had to have some recreation, some recreating himself. And he often resorted there for comfort and friendship and solace. And Mary, one of the sisters, is seated at his feet imbibing the word he's teaching. Martha is doing what comes naturally, preparing a meal for guests. Anything wrong with that? No, unless that's what you emphasize. Here's something that is not wrong in and of itself. But in a choice decision, she made the wrong one. Mary was imbibing the word of Christ. She was concerned with secular matters. She comes in and says, Lord, rebuke Mary that she come and help me with my serving. Instead, he said, Martha, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things, and one thing is needful. And Mary had chosen that good part. It shall not be taken from her. Her priorities on this occasion are superb. Yours are less than the best. Is there anything wrong with being hospitable? No, that's what we ought to be. Anything wrong with a woman preparing a meal? That's what she ought to do with guests. But not in view of something more important. Was that the only time she could prepare a meal? Was there some way she could prepare it ahead of time? Or would 30 minutes or an hour have been too late to wait? The point is, she's like some that I've known that if they're having someone over for lunch, they miss Bible study on Sunday morning. Priority system is wrong. We need to stop and think about what we emphasize. And uh, too many times we fail to understand that when Jesus taught the two little cameo parables of the pearl of great price and the hid treasure in Matthew 13, verses 44 and 45, he was simply saying the Jews were looking for the Messiah, and when they found him, they gave up everything they had to possess him, those who left Judaism became Christians. The other represents the Gentiles who were not looking for the Messiah, but stumbled upon him, and they had to do the same thing that Jews did, give up everything they had to possess him. Are you willing? to surrender and sacrifice in nobility, everything for the priority, number one, Christ and his words. The words I have spoken, the same will judge you in the last day, John 12, 48. Therefore, there couldn't be anything more important than the word of God, imbibed, obeyed, and taught to others. Do you ever find yourself in a Mary Martha situation and choose the lesser? We get so overwhelmed with secular things, we don't take time to study our Bibles. Hours and hours and hours we spend in secular things and emphasis and not much in study of the Bible and deeper study of the Scriptures and ardent, fervent prayer. And so materialism can rear its ugly head in a good environment, in a good home, among good people. Mary had chosen that good part. It should not be taken from her. Turn two pages over to the classic a lesson against covetousness. When I was growing up in every Bible class, when the teacher said, what is covetousness? I could just put it on automatic because I knew the definition. I went 10,000 miles away to Australia to preach, and the first time I asked the question, what is covetousness? I got the same answer that I had 10,000 miles on the other side of the pond. An inordinate desire for the possessions of another. You've heard all your life. But when Jesus rebuked covetousness, he talked about a man who coveted his own goods. Are you listening real carefully now? We can be covetous toward our own possessions. We can make a god, an idol, out of material things. Covetousness is idolatry. Reads Colossians 3, 5. Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable of them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought of himself, saying, What shall I do? He said, Here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build greater barns, and there I'll bestow my goods and my fruits, and I'll say to my soul, Soul, take thine ease, eat, drink, be merry, thou hast much goods made up, laid up for many years. That's what he said. God said, You are a fool. And in the Bible, the word fool never means idiot or imbecile. It means one guilty of moral folly. Thou fool, tonight shall thy soul be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know the sad thing about that? We'd call that fellow an enterprising businessman. We'd praise him. The Lord said, your emphasis is wrong and you're foolish. It's absurd the way you value things. You're not seriously considering things properly. And he has a lot of kin folks today. A woman named Mary had a husband named Jim. She was a faithful member of the church. He never darkened the door. One Sunday, she got up and up nerve to ask him why. 
He said, well, I've got to go down and open up my store. She said, how much are you going to make a year? Clear. And he said, $5,000. How many more years, Jim, do you expect to run in the store? He said, 20. She said, that's five times $100,000. I suppose when you unlock the door, the devil comes in today and says, I'll give you $100,000, Jim, right now. All you'll make the rest of your life if you'll just give me one thing in exchange, your soul. She said, Jim, would you do it? And he said, well, Mary, do you think I'm a fool? She said, it looks like it. And it does look like it with a lot of people. They absolutely sell out on material matters that fade with the passing of the day. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give unto thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Acts 3, 6. And in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, he began to leap and spring. If you read Isaiah 35, go home and read it today. That's fulfillment of prophecy. If they could have laid his feet all the silver and gold in the Roman Empire, it wouldn't compare with what they gave him. We need to understand that silver and gold, printed money, the currency of a nation or the world, is useless. And surely we'll be in heaven. Won't even be in the marketplace of heaven. So this covetous, foolish farmer that we'd call an enterprising businessman should have learned the message of 1 Timothy 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world and it is certain we'll carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. For they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare in the many foolish hurts and lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. But some having coveted after have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain we'll carry nothing out. Naked came out of the world. Naked shall I return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1, 21. So materialism is a big fat zero. And then we come to one that's very well known. Luke 16, verses 19 through 21. The rich man and Lazarus. What a difference a day makes. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The statement of Proverbs 3, 5 to 7, which the rich man, like Laodicea, never learned. The Lord said to Laodicea, you say you're rich. You say you're well dressed. They made the greatest garments in the Roman Empire in Laodicea. They made the greatest eye salve for blind people or near blind people in the ancient world. But he said, you're poor and miserable and naked and blind and wretched. Because like this rich man, they had everything but Christ and that equals zero minus zilch. A certain rich man fared sumptuously every day, dressed like a king, had banqueting like a king. He wasn't concerned with his neighbors, even the poor beggar named Lazarus at his gate who just wanted the crumbs from his table. Insensitive to the needs of others. Man's inhumanity, the man ruled his life. He had much that he could grasp in his greedy hands. But what a difference they made. Both men died, and Lazarus the beggar was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom near to the heart of God. The rich man woke up in torment. He prayed that Lazarus would come and dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his parched tongue. And then he said, please send someone back to earth to my five brethren, lest they come to this place of torment. First time he was ever evangelistic in his entire existence. Too late to do any good. There are going to be millions and millions of people, and many of them Americans, who trusted in certain riches, who lived to gain more and get more, and in a greedy, covetous way, lived their lifetime in that style. And one of these days, what a difference a day makes. The sin of materialism, the mistake of materialism, the overwhelming nature of materialism, I really did grow up in the throes of the Depression. Some people said I started. I was born in 1930, and maybe I did. I don't know. But I didn't know we were in the Depression. My mother's lilting laughter and the happiness we had in the midst of poverty we weren't even aware of. There are a whole lot of people living in $200,000 homes today with two $30,000 automobiles in the driveway and a boat or yacht in the backyard, and they have members of every club in the sporting world, and yet they're miserable. More people, percentage-wise, are committing suicide now than ever before. 
So things and stuff and junk must not bring happiness. This earth and the works therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy living and godliness? Second Peter 3, 11 and following. We have one more. The rich young ruler, Luke 18, Luke 10, 12, 16, 18. But the best account of Christ and the rich young ruler is in Mark 10, for there's something found there, not found in the other accounts. It says Jesus looked on him and loved him. There was something lovable about that young man who sadly loved earthly wealth more than the kingdom of God. You remember he came in a braggadocial frame of mind. Good master, what must I do to inherit, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus began to quote the commandments both he and the rich man lived under. And the man boldly, boastfully said, well, this have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Now he's stunned when he learns there really is something he lacks. Give up your wealth. Give up that which is your God, which you've placed ahead of the God of heaven who made you. Give that up. And come follow me. But he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Nevertheless, Jesus looked on him and loved him. What a lovable young man in so many ways. I preached to a rich young ruler in India one day. That's what they called him. Under a tent in the rain in the southern India. Very cold at night. I taught the men in the school of preaching and men who had come from many miles away all day long for eight days. And at night I preached under a crude tent. Didn't have flaps on, just the top on it. It was raining and very cold. But I looked out there and there was a fellow dressed so much better than anyone else. And he came in an automobile, the only one out there. They said, that's the rich young ruler from that village over the mountain there. He listened as very few people have ever preached to did. And afterwards came up and thanked me. Said he wanted to study more. I said, these brethren here at Mount Zion, as the name of the place, will study with you any day. And they live here. I'll be going back pretty soon. And uh, you could tell by his clothing, he was just by far the wealthiest man in that area. But here, there was something about him I couldn't keep from liking. Uh, he had that intense look in his eyes while I was preaching. And afterwards, you could tell he really meant it when he shook my hand and looked me in the face. I said, he's going to continue to study. I hope someday I hear that he obeyed the truth. Did you know there's a legend that says this rich young ruler later came back and served the Lord? And his name was Barnabas who had land and sold it and laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet to make distribution of the saints. Read Acts chapter 4. I hope we find out in the day of judgment that's true. He wouldn't be the only one challenged to give up materialistic pursuits to serve God. I don't care whether you have 50 cents, a dollar and a half, or a million and a half. The principle is still the same. Are we spiritually minded? Do we really Put the kingdom of God first. Very few people do. Edgar Guest was called the poet laureate of America, longer than any other poet. In his practical books and articles and poems and magazines and in other places of print were thrilling indeed and so down to earth. My favorite, though, is called At the End. Someone gave me a big volume, that thick, where I can't get my hand around it, all he ever wrote. And I think the best poem in there by far was called At the End, which he depicted the death, perhaps, of John D. Rockefeller Sr., the uh, millionaire oil baron that had uh, a monopoly. In fact, that's when the oil monopoly was broken up when he died. Yes, depicts him in the parlor at the funeral home, and friends and associates and workers and high moguls are all around his casket. And he writes, they're not saying how much we're going to miss him. They're secretly saying, now how much of his will be ours? And he said, one day we'll all stand with empty hands and wonder what we're worth. And how very, very true that is. It'd be better to live in a tent and die in Christ than to live in a mansion on Knob Hill and be lost. But what we do with that time, that life, in the years of our influence, and how we expend our effort and our time and our money how we express our love for God or lack of it will determine our eternal destiny. And I really do believe, and I didn't even ask Paul to lead this song. I think this is the greatest song Brother Ted ever wrote. Someday you'll stand to bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? And we'll all boil down to that occasion. And have you ever noticed the cemetery, the rich and the poor, the well-known and little-known all buried under the same ground. 
The silent city of the dead is a leveling influence. How do we spend our time and energy and thought and prayerfulness? Did we live for Jesus? Or live and die in vain, regardless of what we left? You've listened well. Tonight's lesson will really be a further step in the same direction. Eight motivations, eight incentives for heaven. If you'll read Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 6 before you come tonight, you'll be more prepared. And if all of you read it, it'll be a shorter lesson, see, so I won't have to read it all. So I may ask you to first raise your hand if you read it. No, I won't do that. <laughs> We're now going to extend the Lord's invitation. If you've never been baptized into Christ, to put on Christ, to leave the materialistic world and enter a spiritual realm, oh, how you need to do that. Now is the time. If you've been a wayward, erring, materialistic brother or sister, need to come back home and get in the spiritual rule of life, now is the time to make it right. And all of us ought to go home and say, Lord, from this moment on, we're going to be better stewards of what you've entrusted us with. Let us stand and sing.